Okay, everyone, I think we're going to begin. Um, firstly, thanks for coming. Um, and a big thank you for Dolby for hosting us. So a little bit of housekeeping before we begin. Uh, no food or drink in here, please. Uh, Prin will murder us if he finds any. Um, far exit, if anything happens, just head that way straight to the pub. Um, we will be doing some questions. I think we're going to do two lots of 50-minute talks with a short break so you can get some refreshments in between. Um, any questions, please use this microphone. We are filming and recording the event. Um, and most importantly, we'll all be meeting at the Nelly Dean around the corner for further chats and debriefing. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Nick from Acoustica. Cheers. Hello, everybody. Um, I'll be very brief. Uh, I just want actually to, to mention one more thing. Uh, I want to say thanks to Dolby for providing uh, kindly this venue. Uh, it's a fantastic opportunity to, you know, to do the event here. So um, here's Giancarlo. He's the CEO and CTO of Acoustic Audio. We know each other for four or five years. Uh, I think the first time we met actually was uh, for another AES lecture here in London, where I invited him to do a talk. Uh, this is how we met. Uh, maybe Giancarlo, you can say a few words about Acoustic Audio, just uh, so that people know what uh, the company does. Mainly, we are a software company. We are specialized in creating um, sort of uh, virtualization of hardware device. So this is what we are doing. They are. There are a lot of companies today They are specialized in doing software which are trying to mimic the hardware, analog device uh, or vintage device and so on. We are one of them. So basically, this is uh, what Except we that we do it with a different approach and uh, this is partly what the talk will be on uh, today. Yes, my, my, my point is that we are not doing rocket science. It's not something really new from the discovery point of view. It's not... But what we are doing is sort of combining something which is already existing and creating something new. The point is that, okay, maybe other companies or other guys know how to do things, but they are not on the market. So, for example, here, this evening, we are trying to describe a problem we tried to solve, which is reverberation and plate reverberation. It's incredible to say, but there are not many companies specialized, which are doing it, which are doing it properly. For example, taking account harmonic distortion. So maybe there are plate reverbs, but there is not harmonic distortion. Sometimes there are algorithmic approach, which is uh, not close to plate reverb at all. Um, and also, the, sometimes uh, there is the approach based on uh, convolution, but there are several things missing. For example, early reflection uh, split from uh, late reflection and, and things on. There are several products on the market which are trying to do it, but for example, Liquid Sonics is without harmonic distortion. So the point is that there is always something missing and we are trying to fill the gap. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you, Giancarlo. So actually, I'm going to start uh, just with um, a brief, uh, a few brief observations on the on a very famous plate reverb on which uh, you know the plugin that we're going to present today is based on. Uh, now I'm sure that everyone here has a pretty good idea of uh, how, what the plate reverb is and you know how it's built, what it is about. Well, he, he is the one that uh, we inspired our plugin, if if I could put it this way. Um, I'm not going to waste your time with like a really in-depth analysis of how a plate is built, but I just want to point out a few uh, bits about it which I think are relevant to the talk today. Um, so, uh, apologize, apologies for the really uh, amazingly beautiful uh, schematic here. It's probably not the best way to start an AES talk. Um, but you all know what it is. It's, it's, a, it's a piece of steel, uh, roughly say one by two meters, uh, that is suspended uh, by a spring system to a sturgy frame and there will be a, a driving transducer that is in contact with the plate which uh, you know will emit the uh, program material and that that will be picked up uh, typically by two piezo um, uh, transducers so 
you know, okay, a few other things. We know that there might as well be, there as well will be another plate, another felt plate, which can be uh, brought closer to the resonator plate in order to reduce the reverberation time. Um, and clearly, since there's a few uh, drivers there, there will be also an amplifier section. So all of these things, actually, the drivers and the amplifiers will have some non-linearities and some distortions. And as you see, we're trying to represent these uh, accurately in, in the plugin. So this has been taken into account. Now, what's interesting about this device? There's a few things I want to point your attention to. Um, First of all, you would notice that uh, commonly the driving transducer is placed slightly off center. And this will have some implications on the uh, stereo image. So one of the pickups is commonly slightly closer to, uh, uh, to the driver. And uh, as I, you will see in a second in a, in a sign sweep, which I'll show you from, from a plate, uh, you know, one of the channels is usually a bit higher in amplitude. And there might also be some uh, time arrival distances that uh, would affect the stereo image. Um, other than this, what else is going on here? Well, since we're not quite dealing with uh, the speed of sound in air and rather in steel, uh, there's some very interesting um, uh, consequences from this. So you might know this, you might not know this, but you know the speed of sound uh, uh, within this medium is much higher, let's say about 10 times higher than in air. And uh, uh, the other interesting thing is that it's different for different frequencies. So for higher frequencies, sound propagates much faster uh, through, through the steel. And that actually um, has some implications again on the stereo image. Um, another thing that will happen here is due to the very fast speed of sound, you can imagine that this reverb will have no pre-delay really because it's, it's, it's instant, it's just, you know, the, the sounds emitted from here, it's picked up here, but that's really no, no delay at all, you know, with that speed of sound, it's just, it's instant, it happens immediately. Um, so, since we're dealing with such high uh, speeds of sound and such small physical dimensions, you would imagine that there will be a lot of reflections. And that's actually an important point to make. Now, when you have so many reflections, there's a few interesting things that happen. And I believe uh, possibly the best way to describe this is just to quickly jump into see actually what we can expect from a plate like this when we interrogate it. So this is the waveform of a sine sweep from uh, the same plate. It's not the same plate that is used in the plugin, uh, but it's the same model plate. And you can see that actually the frequency response, although you know clearly on the right channel there is a little bump here, overall it's not, it's quite flat in a way. Okay, there's a bit of, uh, you know, loss of low frequency. So roughly here you're going to have your, um, you know, uh, your 100 hertz, it's just about there. There you go, 120 hertz. Uh, and, and, you know, these loss is probably due to the uh, transducer that is used to drive the plate. And then we've got a bit of uh, less energy in the high frequencies. And actually, if we look at the, the sweep, you will uh, clearly see that uh, in the mid frequencies, we have longer reverberation times than in the high frequencies. That's actually quite nice uh, because the highs are never too long. And that's not a bad thing for a reverb to do. Um, now, a few things that you can, uh, you can notice here, there's a lot of rubbish uh, around the, uh, just, sorry, just one second. I think you can probably see it a little bit better here. Um, there's quite a bit of rubbish. I believe that, uh, so it's very important part for our approach since it relies on sampling is to find a very good device. And I think uh, Giancarlo did an excellent work of finding a play that sounded like it was really well tuned, very well maintained. Uh, this is actually from the studio of a very famous engineer here in London, and it's uh, a decently well maintained plate. You can see there's a lot of noise, there's these odd, uh, which are actually quite typical for plates, uh, resonances. And you can clearly see that there's quite a bit of harmonic distortion. Yeah, it's what we were talking about before. Um, now, when I was talking about the frequency response, when you compare this, to a typical uh, sweep of a live room of a high-end studio, 
Uh, now, this was done with an ATC speaker, so it's a 4,000 pound loudspeaker. You could say, oh, well, maybe you know, these irregularities are due to your microphones or whatever, but the fact is that these things are due to room modes and you know, purely uh, the acoustic properties of the space, and that's a well-treated space. And what I want to point out here is that we don't really have these kind of exaggerated boosts or cuts in the plate response. Uh, that's uh, just another quick example of a very large room. This is a huge abandoned factory uh, where the sweep was taken. Even there, you could see that you know there's quite a few dips in the frequency response. Okay, now I want to compare very briefly, uh, just to put it in perspective, the plate um, sound itself to that of, of a few real spaces. So what you see in here is, okay, that's not the most scientific way of doing it. These are hand claps, just because in these spaces I didn't have my speaker with microphones, but they will give you a, a decent idea of uh, what to expect from, I want to point your attention to two, three different spaces. Mm. The first one, it's actually Duke's Hall at Royal Academy of Music, and this place was designed uh, you know, to be well diffused and not have any prominent resonances. Uh, we can probably actually hear that. So that's not the sound of it. Yeah. So you can get an idea of the sound of it, right? Yeah. So that's a concert hall. Yeah. And this was designed with the idea to be suitable for music reproduction, right? Uh, if we look at the frequency response, well, not too bad, you know, there are going to be some uh, problems here and there, but it's not too bad, but it was designed for music. Now, here, I want to bring your attention to something that's probably exactly like the worst opposite, opposite of, of a plate. And I'll get to the plate in a second. This is just so it puts it in perspective. That's beautiful, isn't it? That's a tiny corridor in a house in London. It, you probably all have it in your house. Now, have a look at this. You see what I'm talking about? It's full of all kinds of peaks that are actually going to contribute to this uh, specific character that this space has. But the problem is that when you start adding it on music, yeah, it's cool, but do you want to have it on all of your instruments? Is it going to work in all cases? Not really. Um, this, for instance, is a huge stone tunnel with a lot of diffusion. And why am I bringing this one here? Well, have a listen. That's not too bad, it's quite diffused. Um, well, because in a way, uh, what I see here reminds me to a degree to this, which is the actually now a proper impulse response of the actual plate which is used in the plugin which we'll present today. So have a look at this thing. I mean, it speaks for itself. If I look at the frequency response sort of right in the beginning where the area reflections are, look at that. It almost looks like noise, you know? Like, it's pretty flat, you know, uh, super dense, lots of reflections. Let's hear it. Yeah. Nice. It's quite nice, actually. I like that. Yeah, so that's a sweep that has been, uh, you know, uh, deconvolved to an impulse response. And just to give you an idea, uh, once the uh, felt plate is closer to the resonator plate, and obviously the reverb time is shorter because of that reason, it will sound something like this. This is the same plate. Yeah? So... If we go back... Uh, no, actually, let's not go back anywhere. That's, uh, that's, that's pretty much the, the things that I wanted to say about the plate, just to point your attention to these facts. So the frequency responses doesn't ha really have any obvious resonances. Um, the decay in the high frequencies is pretty short. And overall, you know, there's no... There's, really, it's, it's like almost as if you're looking at the 
some sort of supernatural sustain that can be added on top of the instruments. And I believe this is one of the main reasons why a plate works as you will see on pretty much everything. Like today I'll be doing some audio demonstrations and some of the samples are picked reasonably, others are not picked reasonably at all. We'll be adding plate reverbs to uh, already mixed mastered dance tracks, which is not meant to work. But I believe exactly for these reasons it actually does work. Okay, so let's move on and... Let's, without further ado, have a listen. Ah, it's not my laptop. It's time to buy it, yeah. Okay. So, here's the plugin that uh, we're going to talk about today. Well, mainly we're going to talk about this section of it, which is the plate section, this bit here. As you can see, there's a few different modules. On the left, you've got uh, two modules of uh, equalizer and uh, two filters. Uh, actually, I think uh, the low pass and the high pass filters were built here by uh, Stefano, who is going to talk a bit today as well. Um, here we've got a little mixer section. So on the left is uh, here is the reverb section, and here is the dry sound section. So the idea of this plugin really is that you can use it as a send effect, but actually sometimes you could break the golden rule and use that reverb as an insert if that's what you wanted. Um, so you're going to have the dry sound here and the reverb sound here and if I were to click mute here I can mute either the reverb or just the dry sound and with these controls I can get a bit more reverberation a bit more or less of the dry sound uh, here we've got a compressor and in fact it's not a one compressor there's a few compressors if I were to click on one of these buttons you will see that you know uh, it changes the picture um, I believe actually these modules around the reverberation module are quite important because typically in a studio environment you will use them. You know, you have a console connected and maybe you equalize stuff and EQ stuff and, uh, and compress things and, and so on. So, uh, what I've got here is um, just a quick sample of piano and vocals. Now, I like this one because I think it shows how on something that already has some reverberation, you can add a plate reverb on top and it does not sound flooded. You know, this is the amazing thing about this unit. So you can add more and more and more and more to the point where it's ridiculous and it still doesn't sound too bad. Um, so let's have a listen to it. I just have to point your attention, actually, let, briefly, on this section here, it's important. So we've got a control here for the decay which does what it says, you know, it have shorter or longer reverberation times. And here we have a pre-delay setting. Now the pre-delay setting currently is not set in a way that any real plate reverb can do it. Um, you're used to hear, when you hear pre-delay, you think, oh well, that's going to delay the entire reverberation and nudge it in time. And that's what it does on a lot of plugins. It's not what happens here. Here, what we do is we split the initial part of the impulse response and the tail, and we shift the tail only, but the initial part stays where it is. And that's actually very important, because if you think about it, if you're in a real space, well, you know, the sensation for that space comes from the early reflections, right? So they're very important to localize the sound, to get an idea of what's going on around you. And the tail sometimes, we just want it to bounce with the music, you know, be in the tempo of the music, you know, work with the source. And we'd want to shift it around. Now, if we shift the whole thing, to a degree, that sense of space is gone. Yeah, and you can still do it in other ways. There's workarounds with an additional, uh, using the reverb as a send effect, and you have a little delay plugin before that, so you could achieve the normal pre-delay in that way. This one does not behave in this way. I think Giancarlo will talk a little bit more about it uh, from the technical point of view. Mm. So actually, I probably should have picked another set um, sample first because that's not the exact sound of a plate reverb, but I'll bring it down 
after after we hear it once. Whoops. After we hear it once, and um, you hear oh, actually the actual sound of the of the real plate. So we've got this piano, right? That's what the original sound is like. Now wait for the vocal. I've intentionally added a lot of reverb here. Okay, I'll do this very briefly again. So here it is without anything. And this is me flooding it. Now if you wanted this to behave much more like the real plate, I will actually bring the pre-delay all the way down. And that's the actual impulse response of the real plate. Okay, I hope that that gives you sort of an idea of the sound that you can expect from the unit. I'll very briefly do one more demonstration, I literally have uh, two minutes, and then Giancarlo will jump in and uh, tell you a few geeky things about uh, what's going on under the hood. So here I'm going to do something absolutely ridiculous. I'm jumping on immediately on the most illogical uh, example. That's a very dense, full on, in the low frequencies, uh, a dance track. Let's just bypass this for a second, see what we're dealing with. Now you would think that something like this can never take a lot of reverb. Well, let's hear it. In fact, if you look here, um, I've got both the equalizer and the filter section uh, processing the reverb. So actually, just temporarily, I'm going to switch these off so you can hear the full sound of the, of the plate on that mix. It almost sounds like you're in a large uh, concert hall, yeah? Now, if I were to filter it a bit, because as we've seen on the impulse response, uh, the lows are really long, and uh, you know that will help to not uh, add too much mud to the mix. That's not too bad. You hear it here on the vocals. Now I know my life won't be the same When I look into your eyes I don't mean a man aside Even though I don't know your name Now I know my life won't be the same When I look into... Okay, and as the last thing that I want to point your attention to, I will completely mute the dry sound and we're going to hear just the plate. And why am I doing this? Well, because I want to show you what the drive control does. Our currently is all the way up. Yeah. So what we're doing here, we're exaggerating the harmonic distortion that the real unit had and we're just literally bringing it up by 30 dB. So it's not meant to be this much. Um, when I say drive, we're talking about Giancarlo, how many, five harmonics? I think we are, maybe yeah. five harmonics here, yeah. Uh, it's pretty much what the plate will have. But I believe in this way, when I uh, mute the dry sound, you'll be able to hear better what the drive does. We're talking about distortion reverberation, yeah? Point your attention to the highs and, uh, and the hats. Can you hear how it becomes a bit brighter? 
and uh, you know there's, there's more information in the in the higher frequencies, high mid frequencies. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I think probably it's time yes. for me. It's just about twenty minutes. Yeah. Uh, basically, what Nick was saying is that we are starting from the input response of this unit. Okay. The plugin you was watching before is completely based on sampling. So during this couple of hours, I want to explain how we did it because there is no modeling inside. Everything was sampled: equalization, equalizer, compressor, reverb, distortion. Everything was. Did. The point is that we are not doing something new. We are connecting dots from different areas. Uh, and we started from the impulse response. Okay, the impulse response of this unit, this, uh, this um, uh, reverb unit, this plate reverb unit, uh, is particular because the plate is, first of all, is dense. It means there is a, a lot of density in the reverb. It starts, it starts with a lot of energy. There is a decay, but there is no point where, are we, where we, can, we, we can locate holes, for example. The other point is that it starts immediately, it's instantaneous. Now, there is a problem when you start using uh, this delay uh, in the real world. First of all, this is an impulse response, and uh, what is missing is not alive. So, if you start speaking about the impulse response as a solution, it's clean, you can have a distortion. Then we can have also other examples where you can hear more the distortion we were speaking about then in a plate, distortion is very important. It's a, a part of the sound. And even when the distortion is uh, at the minimum settings, it, it was present. This is the point. The other point is that the impulse response is static and is not good for creating this sort of dynamic effect which was following the vocal track, the song we was, we was hearing. Okay, the point is that we can have a sort of approach for pre-delay, which is a common problem with the uh, reverbs. Uh, our first solution could be, for example, delaying the wall reverb. Now, I want to explain that this is uh, the wrongest thing you can do with, the, um, with the, a plate, because the plate has a lot of energy at the beginning. So when you are trying to move this session, you are sort of creating a hole, and there is nothing on the sound itself, on the basic part of the sound. You are just delaying the effect, so they are sort of detached. And this is not a natural. Um, the point is that we can try to hear it. Uh, this is very important because I want to, to, to this is another reaper, another, another, another machine, we go on with the, mm. <laughs> Yes, this is the point, this is our reverb and so on. Um, the point is that uh, if we apply another unit, another reverb unit on a sort of delay, I'm, I'm trying to create an artificial delay, um, delayed line, because our, our reverb is not a pre-delay which is detached and is independent from the early reflection. So we are building just a track, we are delaying a track and we are applying the reverb on the second track. Okay, the point is that if we try to hear it. Still remember what we kept. Okay, this is muted. This should be the reverb. Still remember what we captured together. Okay, the point is that they are really detached. Uh, now the, the effort is very exaggerated. I want just to place them really very distant one from the other one. One is affected, but it's not natural at all. This is the problem we have with the reverbs with the plate reverbs. So we have to look for a different solution. The other point is that we are forced to a different solution because the implementation we have inside of our, our reverb. So let's go on. And the point is, our first approach for solving this problem could be using dynamic convolution. I go really fast here. Dynamic convolution means simply that we have a different impulse response for a different uh, input level. It's instantaneous because, in general, they are using uh, is a patent, is a patent from a Syntefex Focusrite. They are applying a different impulse response depending on the level, and they are 
they are doing it just because it is direct convolution, because um, you have to modify this uh, impulse response for each incoming sample. Sometimes also creating, for example, aliasing, which is a problem. The other problem is that is heavy, because if you are trying to use direct convolution for a reverb, which has really a long tail, you are really need a powerful computer. More powerful than the computer we are using for our one, and in general they are doing it for short impulse response, and they are doing for in using DSP or other forms. So this is the most important slide. We have a lot of maths, but this is the difference between what we are doing and the other approaches. So this is also the reason why we have also different results and also a different approach, for example, to partition of convolution, things like that. We are trying to create a sort of dynamic convolution which can work with the fast Fourier transform, which is, uh, in this case, is mandatory. Uh, the point is that we can try to slow down this sort of uh, selection of the impulse response, depending on the input level, in order to get a block which can be executed using FFT, so the, the fast Fourier transform. The point is that we have a sort of clock, we have a sort of rate, and we are trying to do the same process we described before, but in a different way, trying to work in blocks. Um, there are several techniques for doing it. For example, we can do sort of interpolation, so we can use in windowing, we, we can do a lot of things in order to make the process smooth. But the point is that we are not working at sample rate speed, but at a block speed, which is used for doing these kind of reverbs in real time. This is the problem. Uh, this sort of approach is clean, because uh, when we are slowing down this sort of selection, Obviously, we are sort of uh, um, lowering the aliasing, uh, also the distortion, and is light. In any case, uh, is not good because, uh, for example, in this case, the reverb has a lot of harmonic distortion, and we want to reproduce it. So, this is uh, nothing new because this is not our approach. In fact, I will present as a Farin approach because it was uh, presented several years ago. There is something interesting about this process because uh, Farina was one of, is a professor, a teacher uh, of Italian University, proposed this solution, um, combining different things coming from different areas. Uh, we create our first plugin and he presented our products, for example, in his convention papers. So it was a sort of exchange because we were creating a sort of a practical uh, uh, solution for the theory, sometimes it was presented like the theory, then after they created a lot of things, but in any case, at the beginning, we were useful for testing uh, the first theory about uh, this new approach. Uh, it's very simple because we can see our um, Volterra series, uh, which is an expansion which can con contain a, a number very uh, in, of uh, infinite, infinite number of terms, we can just uh, consider the terms on the diagonal. The point is, we want to take into account the interharmonic distortion, intermodulation, and we want just to take in account the terms which are on the diagonal, in any case, which are for each uh, multiple of the fundamental. Uh, the point is that, um, for example, if we have five harmonics, four harmonics and the fundamental, we need just five terms. So we can simplify an equation which is not simple to do in real time. So this is pretty basic. And Farina suggested to use uh, a sort of test on which has, uh, is a sunny sweep, a logarithmic sunny sweep. This is the, um, the description of the equation used for this sunny sweep. And is a sort of a logarithmic approach. Is there is this exponential, uh, and this is particular because when when you use this uh, um, this test on and you try to sample, there is something interesting which is going on. In the upper part of the this slide, you have uh, the result. So we are sampling our reverb, our real unit, using this test on. And we can try to do the convolution using 
uh, the same sine sweep, which is reversed, and there is a sort of fade on this, uh, uh, on this uh, uh, test on, which is uh, about 6 dB for octave. The point is that there is a sort of approach for doing uh, the, the convolution without using uh, the division in frequency, which is the normal approach which is used for the convolution, because the properties of this uh, particular test on. Uh, the point is that the test stone we are using is uh, like a sort of a prism. Like we are sort of splitting colors normally when uh, there is the light, uh, white light, and we can get colors. This particular tone can get uh, a sort of uh, splitting of harmonics uh, as a result of uh, the, um, the, 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 the simple usage of this test tone. So, if we make the convolution, just making the direct convolution of this inverse tone with the fundamental, we get this sort of uh, result where we have different terms which are sort of distributed in the space and they are really clean. We can, we can take them and we can process them. They are not directly harmonics, but there is a way for getting harmonics from them. The process is uh, pretty simple. We can uh, just uh, note that the second equation is uh, the Volterra series, uh, where we just applied the, the test on. Uh, the first one is simply um, sort of taking this, uh, this, uh, uh, this waveform and uh, moving it uh, and uh, um, making a, a direct convolution, a linear convolution, with the, the, this, uh, the, the terms we have uh, in this plane, they are split, they are shifted. So they are summed in this way. They, we have a, a couple of equations and we can solve this system. At the end, we can solve and we can get finally kernels, which are used in the other formula. So the process is very simple. We are using just uh, different test on. Uh, we can uh, derive even a nine number of harmonics. The problem is the noise. We, we can uh, reach also, we, we try to use 15 also to any of them, but more than 10 harmonics, there is a problem because it is not practical to, to derive them because they are damaged by noise. There are the noise in technique which are using lately. Uh, and other technique for debugging, uh, for fixing. For example, uh, we can uh, sort of debug with the sine sweep, which are trying to derive, uh, I don't know, the, um, which should be the level of other harmonics, and try to fix level of them, trying to find the bug. So trying to fix the wrong one. Uh, but in any case, uh, this. Uh, system is quite limited because when you go up with the number of harmonics, you have a problem, you have issues. Okay, so what do we want to do? We want to apply this system for our problem. And uh, we have uh, the decay control. The idea is if we can use simple impulse response, instead of stretching, the impulse response. We can sample all position of this uh, unit uh, and we can select the correct one when we select a different decay time. For example, in the reverb we were speaking about, we sampled the 16 position and the approximation is quite good. Uh, just consider that the system can create also uh, intermediate position from uh, the sampled one, so you can interpolate them in several ways, and you can have a sort of a continuous effect. It works also on reverbs. Mainly this technique is the one we are using on equalizers. For example, we sample uh, a subset of a position and we try to derive the missing one in real time. Okay, this system is accurate and is elegant. If we merge with everything we said before, we have this uh, complete system, which is uh, we are a bit unlucky, is the wrong one, is the system we have been using for years, and it has a problem. 
Um, what do we see? We have a decay control. Uh, we have, uh, uh, for example, the acoustic convolution, let's call it this way, uh, which is also working on harmonics. So um, not only using the variable of decay, but using also the input level, we can derive a different level of the reverb. So we can have a reverb which is really alive because um, is changing. It's changing depending on the input level. Uh, everything can also be executed on harmonics. Everything is real time. The problem in this model is that we are limited because we cannot go as much fast as we want. This is the main problem. We have been using this sort of a solution for years and it was not working perfectly. There is a product which we uh, released on the market, which is Nebula, which is famous for reverbs. And a lot of people are telling the same thing. Okay, reverbs are quite good, but really I can hear there are clicks, there are artifacts. If I have a bass drum, I try to process using this reverb and I can hear there are clicks. The reason is simple. We cannot go fast because there is the fast Fourier transform. So there is a limitation how much faster we can select a different input response. And there is also heavy on CPU. So maybe this is not the correct solution. In any case, using this system, we can, uh, uh, we can get a sort of initial solution to the problem. The point is that, let's suppose that we have an internal rate because we want to select a different input response. Let's suppose we have a sort of a uniform partition. Okay, let me explain what we mean for uniform partition. In any case, if we want really to go fast, we have to limit the size of the input response. This is the problem. Because in any case, even if we, we make a good partition, in any case, we have a lot of partitions to do in real time. So uh, even if we have a good system for um, reducing latency, in any case, this size of the input response is a sort of, uh, um, is a sort of a constraint because we cannot go as much fast as we want unless we have a powerful computer, a powerful CPU. So this is the real problem. But we want to decrease this rate. We want to go at a particular speed because this reverb is really alive. You hear, when we were trying to hear the, the early reflection, it was really particular. I want to make an example on the, the real uh, reverb. Then, um, okay, let's open again the, the track you were hearing before. Uh, also, the, for example, before um, Nick showed harmonic distortion, I want to show to you what, what, what I mean for harmonic distortion. This is an acoustic guitar. Okay. Okay. If I decrease the length, if I increase the distortion. We increased it quite a lot, but I want to explain that the reverb sound, this particular reverb sound, is really connected with the harmonic distortion. And this is really important to do. But it's not the only thing. It's also connected with the speedness we have in the reproduction. And if I sort of uh, limit the reverb to the early reflection, I can show to you what is doing this reverb. For example, I have my vocal track. You are hearing the early part of the reverb. This part should follow the input source accurately. If it doesn't do it, it's like a normal input response and the music is not moving anymore. This part is the most important time for then nothing can take. Then, if we combine with also other element, everything is alive. My heart, this is where... Okay, I was speaking about the pre-delay. Now this is the new solution we'll explain later. Let's suppose we don't have a pre-delay. Still, my heart, this is where... is following. Why is following? Because it's fast. 
So the previous solution we had for reverbs was not working perfectly because it was slow. We had harmonic distortion, it was good, but harmonic distortion was slow. The early reflection was not moving in the correct way. This is the problem we had. And if we have a long tail, we see that everything is really good. Turning back, so put your hands around my... If I remove the early reflection, this is this sort of moving one, you hear that everything is really Turning back, boring. So put your hands around my heart. The point is that the reverb has the same harmonic distortion, everything is the same, but it's a sort of disconnected from the tail. It's not glued anymore. The point is that you need this part. Turning back, so put your hands around my heart. It's a sort of 3D sound. You have the perception of the direction of the source. And this is possible just because we are going fast. Now, how we can go fast? Because this is uh, the, the point. Because we, we were in this, uh, in this situation. This is the new solution. It's uh, simple to do. It, for, it was uh, simple to do for us because we had a lot of experience in preamplifiers. During these, year, these years, we tried to improve our preamplifiers, our preamp model, modeling, and so on. Uh, yes, and the point is that our preamps were good, our reverbs not. So the simple solution is simply to split them. Now this operation is not simple because you see there is nothing to split. You have to make a sort of artificial splitting, but it's very important that you should split in a way that the first part can go as much fast as possible without using too much CPU. Now, this solution, what does it mean, this solution? Then we have a sort of a dynamic session, which is the first one where we need something we, which is really alive. And we have a sort of a fast refresh rate. Uh, in our test, 20 Hz are a good point, we, we need to go faster than 20 Hz. Uh, this is uh, the, the golden rule, which is also for, for video. We discovered that this, this uh, sort of rule is working also for audio. You cannot hear anymore the, the, the frame when it's faster, not only for the video, but also for the audio. So this 20 Hz is a sort of splitting point. You should go faster, otherwise you hear that is a clicking. Before, they were around 180 milliseconds, okay? So, a lot more, but not so much more, but they were hearing it. 20 Hz is uh, a lot less, a, a bit less than before, but it is enough for hearing it in a proper way. Then we have also the tail, and our tail is just doing also the harmonic distortion. We are not interested in doing something which is alive, because in this point we are trying to minimize the CPU load. So this is what we are doing. We are just splitting them. And the point is that uh, in our model we have a sort of a first generator, okay, we have a sort of generation of the impulse response and the uh, Volterra kernels. And we have another module which is doing rendering. We speak a lot about it in, in the second part because we want to describe how partition convolution is, uh, is executed using the new constraints because we have a different situation. But in any case, our module is a composite but sort of a generator, which is the first part uh, of uh, kernels and a sort of engine which is just doing a sort of non-linear harmonic convolution. And the point, okay, is that starting from the second part of the, of the, uh, we will try to explain what is the difference between doing the, for example, partition and convolution uh, or uniform convolution with the 
in our case, where we have a moving uh, impulse response, we have a, something, a sort of impulse response which, which is changing in real time, and the normal case where the impulse response is fixed, because this is the new problem we introduced. So, Nick, if I don't know, we are in time. If you want to show uh, other audio files, in the, and we can do the break, and we can go deep in the second hour. Yeah, I could in play a few room. more examples, maybe. OK. Yeah. OK. Is this my rip? <laughs> OK. There's too many of them here. OK. Yeah, let's just hear it quickly on a, on a, on a, just a clean vocal. So I didn't know, so the tail is not actually dynamic, it's just the area reflections that really, are Really, we are doing a bit of dynamic also in the tail, but it's very slow and it's very interpolated. This is the point. The trick is that we are not interested in doing it at the speedness we are using for the early part. So we can reduce calculation in the tail, and we can get something which is alive in the first part. Harmonic distortion is not very important in the early part because we are more interested in the dynamic effect. So even if you have harmonics in the first part, if they are more static, it doesn't change. You should take into account that harmonics are already alive because when you change the input level, the result changes continuously. It's not like the first term or the impulse response. The first term or the impulse response is a sort of a static normally. You hear it that is static. With harmonics, you don't hear them static. This is the point. Because a different input level is changing continuously the response. So what we discovered during the years, that we were trying to modify our harmonics following them. It was really complex to do. But it's not something you hear. When you want to hear your effect, and you are trying to focus on it, you don't hear difference. But on the dynamic first term, this is a really a different story because this sort of term is really, really static normally. You hear it, it's boring, and you have to move it in order to follow your audio. So this is the trick. Okay, maybe I can briefly show here, this, this is just a vocal track, so it's a bit easier to hear what the, the reverb does. And I think it might be good to, to demo what, uh, how the reflections sound like. And I'll just bypass the plugins so you can hear what that does. Turn around, then I closed my eyes and ran with all my heart. I braced myself against the wall. This is a, the most like important the room. Placed my gate against exactly. the wall. This, this is the now point. I Stand with nothing left. It's like a room. Thank God, like gold, I have nothing left. Actually, if you, if, we, if, you, if you play just the beginning of the impulse response, it sounds almost like noise, except that you can actually localize, you can localize. where it comes point. from, where it comes from, which creates this, you know, the stereo this is the most important. This is the most important part of the sound of a plate reverb. The point is that the plate reverb, differently from other um, devices, is not really ready for being splitted. Because if you take a lexicon impulse response, you can detach easily the first section from the late, because it's already detached. If you take a digital reverberator, they are already detached. There is a space. There is already an artificial space created, which is, doesn't exist in a real space. This is the problem. But a plate, which is really dense, because it was uh, normally, what, what is, uh, what is a, a, a plate reverb? Before there were uh, acoustic spaces. Then there was a new problem, how to get the, an acoustic space in a small space. So they created this sort of uh, machine, wood machine, small wood machine, which is going to replace a big space. But you don't have a big space, it's you have a plate. So the point is that this big plate, properly tuned, we were really very lucky because, uh, lucky because uh, the owners of this plate, they are located in Venice, they are really good for tuning the plates and they have spent a lot of years for tuning them. In fact, this plate is very good. 
The point is that it's a plate and you can hear a sort of acoustic space for the longest decay, but not for the shortest one. When it's a short, you hear this metallic bit because it's a plate. This is the point. The second part is more about the approach for doing it in real time. And also why our, our process is slightly different from the normal one. Because we have a different constraint. For example, we have this moving impulse response. Normally, this impulse response, this moving kernel, is not taken account in any paper because it is not something which is taken account from a normal convention paper. And we have this sort of new requirement because we need to move the impulse response and also the harmonics. We have to change them in real time at a frequency rate. So we have a new problem to solve. Okay, normally this is the, the basic block of uh, convolution. It's very simple. Uh, for example, we have uh, a fast Fourier transform of the input response on the top. We have the fast Fourier transform of the input source on the left. And in frequency, it's just a multiplication, and we have an inverse uh, fast Fourier. So this is the basic, the basic representation of the, the convolution. And if we don't make any partitioning of the input response on the top, we see that we have a big latency, but using a fast Fourier transform, in any case, we are saving calculation compared with the normal direct convolution. In any case, the point is that we are doing fast Fourier transform also for the input response. This is the main problem we have. So, this is the basic approach, which is basically also presented in many convention papers. We are trying to make a sort of a partition of the impulse response and of the uh, impulse source, which is the X. Uh, normally, normally, the partitioning of the impulse response is not taken account. As you can see, there is no fast Fourier transform because we can suppose they are calculated offline and they, we are using this sort of uh, static data for our calculations. So this sort of uh, uniform partition, what is telling us is that we are sort of making a partition of the source of the X. So we are doing more fast Fourier transform, but the process is uh, very good because we can decrease the latency. So we can uh, say that our latency is the smallest block, uh, this, the block we are using this uh, uniform partition. And there is also a sort of uh, saving in calculation because uh, we have uh, a sort of a single inverse fast Fourier transform, because uh, there are many uh, addition and multiplications. Uh, okay, in this, uh, in this slide we are not taking account uh, overlap and saving and overlap and other techniques, because uh, when you make a, a product in the frequency, you have a larger block, so you have to uh, make an addition for the result in a clever way. But it's, this is not the problem. It's not taking calculation, it's not taking resources, it's just an addition. Uh, the point is that we have a single FFT and we have a single inverse FFT and we are reducing calculation. So, what they are proposing? They are proposing... Um, okay, this is the, the first this slide, we, we can say that this is a uniform partition. Using this sort of clever approach, normally they are uh, referred as FDL, which are frequency domain delay line. Uh, we named them stream. We use this sort of a term since the beginning. Um, FDL or streams in this, uh, in this uh, presentation is more or less the same. Uh, there are several... This is the problem. When we are uh, taking account also the harmonic distortion, our uniform partition changes is a bit more complex because we are also taking account uh, harmonics. So we have more convolution. But this is nothing new here. We have a single inverse FFT. So we are saving calculations. So this is normally what you can find on uh, papers. They are suggesting to use the uniform partition. For harmonic distortion, they are suggesting this approach. 
uh, they are not taking account that the, our input response changes. This is the problem. So for them, everything is just solved in this way. And they say, okay, you can maybe use also um, something which is not uniform, but in any case also this system is working. The problem is that when you have also a moving impulse response, so an impulse response which change in real time is not optimized anymore. So this is the basic approach used for uh, making optimization proposed by Gardner. This is a patent proposed several years ago. The point is that we can split our impulse response in several different FDL or streams. And we can have a different partition, which is not a uniform anymore. Uh, why we are doing it? Because the real latency of our system is the smallest partition. So, for example, in this case, we have the impulse response on the top. Then we have, uh, for example, uh, our normal partition, which is the second one on the bottom. But we can try to split again one of the blocks in uh, more parts and get a different uh, uniform partition on it. So a different uh, FDL, a different stream. So we have a uniform nonlinear in the first row, another uniform nonlinear in the second row. The point is that the larger partition is sort of idle in the first block. So real, your problem is how to go fast in making the first uniform nonlinear partition in order to answer properly to the system. Because the other one, even if the calculation is heavy, and I can tell you it's very heavy, especially for the multiplication and addition on this system, but the problem about answering correctly to the system before the deadline, what you have as a clicks of the system, and the system is clicking because it cannot handle it in real time, the problem is the first one. So also latency, latency is the smallest one. Uh, the load is pretty good because in the first uh, the, the slide before, we added that our uh, load was more or less linear with the number of harmonics. Zeta is, zeta is the number of harmonics, uh, n is the, the, the size of the uniform block. In this case, we have t is the smallest block, and more or less is uh, less than the number of harmonics multiplied by the total number of uh, partitions, and not dependent on the, their size, just the number of partitions, and the smallest block uh, logarithmic uh, calculation. So the system is very good because we can get really a low latency and really the load is not bad. This is the problem. This is the, this is the solution. Uh, now, the point is, following our previous model, we say that the LED stream is more or less static. Okay, let's suppose it's more or less static. It's not true because we are doing it slightly dynamic, okay? But if we consider it static, we see that the LED stream is more or less composed by the harmonics. And our calculation more or less is uh, uh, proportional to the number of direct fast Fourier transform on the X. There are ways for optimize them. Let's suppose that we have a different fast Fourier transform on them. And we have a single inverse FFT for getting the result back. This one is not important. So when the input response is constant, we have in this case five, five fast Fourier transform because more or less in our reverbs we are taking account of five harmonics. I told you before, is more or less related with the, the number of uh, harmonics which are appreciated by customers, and also which is possible because the noise. Uh, you can get maybe even uh, seven uh, terms, sometimes nine, sometimes 11. We tested also 15, but they are damaged by noise. So normally five is the number which is possible even in the noise most noise system like um, a plate reverberator 
And plate reverberator is really noisy. So you can derive more than five, uh, five terms. So four harmonics and one fundamental. So the let stream, this is uh, the model for the let stream. But I told you that the early stream can be modeled like something dynamic. So there is not harmonic distortion anymore. But you have to do continuously fast Fourier transform for the impulse response, which is the new, is the new problem. And normally, for the size we I proposed, we we proposed it at the beginning of the of our description. For the size I proposed, which was uh, around 150 uh, milliseconds, uh, there are four terms. So we are in a similar situation. We have five fast Fourier transform for the X. We have this uh, variable impulse response and no harmonics at all. Okay, and so we are in a similar situation. This is uh, the first uh, result we have. Late and early have a similar load. In fact, also in our plugin, their load is very similar. It's very balanced. There is this is the reason. This is the the reason why they are so so close one to the other one. Now, the problem is the following one. If we follow the Gardner proposal, Gardner proposed to use this not uniform partition, and they say that we need to reach. The, the strategy, a good strategy is to reach the um, biggest possible FDL as soon as possible. Each two of them, you are increasing the, the block size uh, is twice uh, bigger. So it's a sort of uh, strategy for reaching immediately the biggest block because the FFT uh, is uh, uh, less heavy because it's logarithmic. So we are trying to minimize the the weight for the FFT. But in any case, we see this is not exactly uh, the best approach. It was also described by Garcia several years later, because using the garden approach, we are sort of adding a new fast Fourier transform for the X in this particular example. So in the line before, in the, in the first line, we see that garden, we have, we have one, one, two, two, so this is the second FDL, then we have three, three. So we are using three, uh, three streams, and one of them is uh, the three, and is based on the calculation of larger, larger block of X. While we can have a, a clever approach just reducing the number of uh, FDL, the number of streams. We are just using one and two. So we are doing less FFT on X. So our strategy in this case is Garden is not the optimal solution because we need to minimize the fast Fourier transform on the X. But Garcia proposed another solution. Um, in this particular example, for example, uh, there are just a couple of streams, but is, is using a lot of terms for the smallest block for the smallest uh, stream. Uh, this sort of a solution can be calculated like FFTW is uh, calculated and making a sort of uh, application which is uh, trying to optimize the best uh, configuration of your partition. Uh, just uh, try all possible combination of, uh, of partitions and looking for, uh, looking for the best, the best uh, solution. Now, the solution proposed by Garcia is not working in our case because Garcia doesn't have a, a sort of a moving impulse response. And more or less, it doesn't have this sort of optimization of the inverse uh, fast Fourier transform. In fact, if I have more harmonics, if I want really to optimize my system, I want to reduce the inverse uh, fast Fourier transform. So, I can get a single one from all my blocks if I'm using the same block size. What does it mean? That I need less uh, items of the first stream uh, before than what Garcia is proposing. And uh, we see that uh, we need to optimize our harmonics because they are 
in general more than the, the, the single fundamental. So since the harmonics are shorter generally and we want to minimize the CPU load, we have a shorter input response, so we have a different split in a different partition, and we have to use the same partition also for the other ones in order to minimize the number of inverse fast Fourier transformers. So this is the first result. Using our different approach, we are, our conclusion is a little different on the optimization. This is uh, our, our point. So this is what we are doing is not rocket science. I, I told you at the beginning. We are not doing something which is, uh, but the result is different because we are doing something different in a different way. Just because we have a, an input response which changes in real time means that we have a different partition of our system and a different optimization. This is the point. So, um, this is my last slide before, before Stefano, we are in time, perfectly in time. Uh, this is uh, another thing which is not reported many times on uh, convention papers, uh, but uh, is a, a common solution used um, in the DCP world. You can uh, get something which goes in real time. For example, we have a zero latency approach. Zero latency is very simple to do. Uh, you can uh, create an, a stream or FDL which is working with direct convolution. Normally, you select this one when direct convolution is taking less calculation than a fast Fourier transform. So less 32 samples or 64 samples depending on the library you are using. So using this sort of partition and using the direct convolution on the uh, first, first block, we can get a sort of zero latency. Uh, in any case, this, this zero latency normally is a fake. It's another thing which is not reported many times on, uh, on papers. Because when you record an input response, the problem is that the, normally the gear, or the analog gear, has a latency and it has a transient. It needs a lot of samples for reaching okay, the steady value. So the problem is that normally is half a millisecond, but is, there is a time. And this time means that you cannot have normally a perfectly zero latency system. Even if your engine is calculating a zero latency system, you cannot do because your system is slightly translated. There is a sort of delay. Delay because the sample needs a bit of time for reaching the peak value. So the input response needs a bit of time. So zero latency system normally in the real world doesn't exist. If you use a normal hardware device, you try to make a, a proper assessment of it, of it, you discover that there is a delay because normally hardware device have this sort of delay. So this is uh, the, our, our first part of the second hour. I think there is a Stefano, which is um, uh, a guy which is uh, working with acoustica. Is an external consultant. Consultant is uh, is really talent, and he solved a lot of problem we we had in our in our history. And uh, in my opinion, he is the best uh, one which could be describe several sampling technique because his more is daily work with. Uh, Thank you. Well, I'm Stefano Dallora. I work with Acoustica Audio um, as an external developer and collaborator. Uh, Giancarlo asked me to come here tonight and tell you something about my sampling experience with Acoustica. So mine won't be a technical speech at all. So <laughs> it's going to be quite pra practical and with uh, few real life examples as well. So you might consider it a kind of extension of the coffee break, <laughs> if you want, without coffee, unfortunately. Anyway, um, I, met, uh, I met Giancarlo and all the staff at Acoustica um, about three years ago during a workshop uh, which they held in uh, Lodi, uh, Acoustica headquarters. Mm, I went there before because I, um, I already knew about the technology which they claim to be able to sample and then replicate in digital form uh, 
almost any analog device. So I, I was curious about this. And you see, I live less than an hour drive from Lodi, and the, the workshop was free, so I had to go. Uh, there was no question about it. I went there, and uh, actually, it was fascinating, because first, it did work, and uh, it worked well. Second, um, I, I could see um, lots of possible extensions of this basic concept which I will tell you about in a moment. Um, I'd like tonight just to mm, make two points, essentially. Mm, based, just based uh, on my experience in these years, um, sampling hardware of many different kinds. First point, um, I know that I just have to uh, really know the machine I'm sampling to sample it uh, properly. Um, I have to study the schematics, if I have one at hand. I have to study the circuitry. Uh, I have to really mm, understand deeply the way it works. Um, so case in point, um, one of the first jobs I did for Acoustica, for the plug-in Honey, uh, which is based on a famous American console, uh, the one used for uh, many Michael Jackson's hits. I want do names uh, because I'm, I was told not to do okay so <laughs> hush hush uh, anyway uh, this um, console now I had to sample mm, the the plugin uh, includes uh, an EQ section and a few preamps selectable preamps uh, the section uh, sorry the EQ is uh, made up of uh, four different sections, the usual lows, low mids, uh, high mids and highs. And then uh, we have uh, filters too, two filters. Mm, so um, this technology allows us to sample separately each um, aspect, each uh, behavior of the machine. I mean, uh, we can sample uh, just the frequency and phase response of an equalizer. And then, in a separate session later, we can sample uh, the dynamic response or harmonic response, if you want. And then we, uh, so we have these single little modules, which are nebula programs, actually. And we put together them, uh, deciding, uh, we decide the rules. Um, there's a script language, uh, an XML language which uh, dictates the rules uh, with, uh, by which um, the modules speak between themselves, uh, how the distortion reacts to input level or it reacts to the uh, low frequency level, for instance, of the equalizer, which happens, uh, usually it happens uh, with an um, uh, inductor-based equalizer, for instance. So we need all these single little programs. And that means that we, uh, I had to sample each section of the EQ separately. I mean, just the lows, then just the uh, mid, low mids, etc. Now, if we uh, consider like a black box, the whole console, we have uh, this kind of signal path, which is very long and very troubled mm -hmm. in a way, if you want, because there are a series of non-perfectly linear elements in it. The, we have two transformers, we have the VCA, so we're talking about a machine uh, more than 30 years old, so VCAs weren't yet uh, state-of-the-art back then. We have a summing stage and the output stage. All these stages do something to the sound, to the, they color the sound, obviously, and which this is why we, we appreciate uh, one particular machine, of course. But if I were to sample the equalizer uh, going through the whole thing, then in the end, assembling the single units, we would have uh, four times the same uh, color repeated over and over again. And of course, it adds up. This is uh, the frequency response of the console, which is uh, the, the steps, the horizontal steps are half a dB. So, um, it goes a bit uh, up um, 10 kilohertz, just by, I think, 0.2 dBs. Goes down a bit on 20 kilohertz, which is perfectly normal, I mean. I mean, 
in, this, in particular, this council is famous for not being harsh or shrill. And this maybe is one of the reasons why this particular response. And this is the phase response, which goes down 28 degrees at 20 kilo, which again is perfectly normal with transformers. We have two of them in this chain. So far, so good. If I go four times through this console, I have this. This is a frequency response. And we have a, um, uh, almost a 1 dB difference between highs and lows. And uh, uh, the, 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 the graph quickly descends on uh, 20 kilohertz. It's, uh, I think, 1 dB down there, which is not really a good thing. It's, it's not what you expect from, from such a machine, usually. But even worse, this is the phase response we get, which is a very worrying <laughs> minus 100, more than 100 degrees at 20 kilos. Something that and is not good at all, of course. Mm -hmm. Hmm? Yes, of course, on transients, it's really, really a, it's not a good thing, absolutely. So, um, you have to study the schematics, the, the circuitry of the, of the thing, and the, the block structures as well. And this is one possible solution to um, alleviate the problem, at least. If uh, we uh, inject the signal into the line preamp, we uh, avoid uh, passing through the input transformer. And then, uh, picking up the signal from the insert output, we don't go through all the rest of the chain which is a much better solution. Yet, uh, it's not the ideal one, because um, looking at the, at the schematics, uh, you can see that uh, this is a serial equalizer. It's built in this way. You know, you can have uh, uh, parallel topologies or serial topologies and equalizers. You can have one single um, active element driving a series of filters. But not in, in this case, you can see we have uh, different uh, um, actually, op amps in this case, each one uh, driving its own section of the equalizer. I'm not talking about the filters, but of course, are, it's just the same matter, of course. Uh, so, the perfect solution in this case is to uh, separate the amps and uh, disconnect the nodes of the circuit between each uh, stage of the, uh, of the equalizer. And this is what I did. Of course, this um, means that you have to <laughs> physically um, alter the, the circuit. But in this case, it was easy. Uh, because uh, it was just a matter of plugging out uh, an IC from its socket. And I built uh, uh, another socket on a, on a small board with flying wires. So I could connect uh, only the, the relevant op-amp for each section because I wanted to use the original ICs, you see, because uh, they were proprietary. I think they were marked uh, HA something, I can't remember the number now. But they, was were, they were made specifically for th that brand that I won't name. Um, so um, this is an example of how you, you have to approach any, any sampling, because each hardware is different. Uh, each machine has its own uh, specific uh, features, and you have to adapt, really adapt your, your sampling strategy to that uh, specific machine. Another, another example that uh, came to my mind yesterday while I was thinking about the speech, uh, if uh, you were to sample something like, uh, I think I can say it, Pultec uh, EQ, because <laughs> it's quite old and out of the games now. Um, which is a passive EQ. Well, in that case, you can uh, um, go to the to the extreme, really, and uh, um, really pull out the, tu the the vacuum tubes from the circuit at all. If you want, I repeat, if you want, if you want to sample just the EQ response, just the phase and EQ. Uh, sorry, the frequency and phase response on the, uh, the filter cell. Mm. The only the only care is uh, you have you you must have is to uh, load the circuit with the right impedance of course input and output impedance, but as for the rest we uh, don't need it at this sampling stage uh, the the color of the machine 
the distortion of the machine, but just frequency and phase. And so uh, that would be another strategy, a different one, because the machine is different. So this is, was the first point I wanted to make tonight. You have no time machine, I could say. <laughs> uh, but the second one, sorry, but I just wanted to <laughs> um, break into my presentation. Uh, the second one, um, we, we could say, we might say that we, we can turn this concept on its head. Uh, not just uh, uh, adapt your sampling to the machine, but uh, why not? Uh, we could, I mean, we could build uh, some hardware specifically, intended specifically for sampling, uh, meant just for that. And this allows us to build um, things uh, to, to obtain, in the end, uh, to have uh, plugins which do things that are not possible in reality. Um, this is another case in point. I, it's, a, it's a library I will be selling, I hope, shortly, as soon as Aquarius software will be up and running in all its glory. <laughs> so we'll, we're going to have a, a marketplace in Acoustica where to buy plugins and libraries, etc. Um, it's, uh, act, the idea behind it is simple. Actually, they are, they are two shell filters, a low and a high shelf. And so far, nothing, nothing exception. The plugin is aptly named Shelf Control, of course. And this is the, I think it's not the final GUI, but something like this. You see, you see there's, of course, there's a preamp if you want some extra color. Then a low shelf, high shelf, usual uh, level and frequency controls. But that shape control, that, that's the one that makes a difference. Well, you know, uh, usually shelves are made out with um, uh, us using uh, one pole filters in most cases. Uh, so these filters give us, give us the, that um, smooth slope, uh, very musical one, very easy to use. But you could use as well a, a two pole filter. And in this case, like this classic silent key low pass filter. And in this case, you can um, design this filter in different ways. You can have different mm, Q values for this filter, depending on uh, the, the ratio, for instance, the ratio of the C1 and C2. So you can have resonances, peaks, different peaks or not, peak, no peaks at all, if you want, with this filter. So I built this uh, circuit um, with... Uh, um, a number of sockets in it, so I could change values, I could change uh, components, add them, so, mm, take away things at will. And uh, um, first I sampled the, the one pole shelf. I went uh, f for uh, third octave uh, frequency steps, I seem to remember. Um, different levels, booster cut levels, of course. Uh, with just the, the usual topology. Then I built, uh, inserted this filter with a very high Q. Uh, I had uh, the final response of the shelf, had uh, um, uh, six plus six dB peak before the cut, or uh, six dB dip before the, the, the boost. So quite an, uh, um, a, a huge one, if you want. But inserting some damping resistors in the circuit, I could control this resonance so that I could have all the, the, the I could adjust the resonance and all the, in, in all the, is, uh, is strength if you want. So no resonance at all, then a bit more and the whole thing. And uh, this is the result. Uh, these are the shapes of the usual shell filter, as I said before, one pole filter. This is uh, the maximum shape. You see that dip for each frequency before the, bus, the boost. Um, I think the, there are a um, few examples like this in, uh, in, in British consoles, actually. Uh, some of them had this kind of a shape, depending on the, on the letter or the series <laughs> or the EQ. And I sampled this as well, which is a damped uh, resonance but with the uh, 12 dB slope, which is different from this, you see. It's much steeper, but no resonance. 
And if you see the, the title up there, this is a shape 0%, this is full 100%, and this is halfway 50%. The beauty in this thing, uh, with this technology, is that we, uh, the software interpolates, as Giancarlo said before, can interpolate all these shapes. So I can have this, a continuously changing shape, a control which uh, allows me to continuously morph the shape from the smoothest one, the, the gentlest one, to the middle one, and uh, gradually increasing the resonance up to, or down in this case, to 6 dB. And this is something you, it's, at, least, at least I think it's very difficult to, real, to have in, in, in our analog world. Because it means having lots of uh, value, ch changing values in the circuit. Because for each step in, the fre in frequency, you have to change all the values of the damping resistors, the condensers. Often I had to use um, more condensers in parallel because I didn't have the right value, because you need the specific values. So you, you could build a circuit like this, actually, but uh, it would be very, very co with a very complex switching scheme, at least. And you couldn't have any way a continuous control over this. Even more, also the frequency control is continuous because the software again interpolates the frequencies. And I think this would be really impossible. Uh, I don't think I'm, I'm, I'm wrong on this. I've been thinking about it, but I think it's plain impossible in reality to have something like this. So you see, we can have both, the best of both worlds. Because, okay, granted, this is a digital plugin that I have, but first, it really sounds like analog, or say 95% like, like it. It behaves like analog and does things that uh, normally you can't achieve from an analog circuit, a real analog circuit. Well, I think that's all. I don't know. Maybe it got a bit longer than intended. So anyway, thanks for listening. Good night. <laughs>showed you compression and the compressors in the same device we created. But I didn't explain exactly the technique. Someone was asking about it. So we have this sort of uh, acoustic convolution on the right. How we can select a different assessment of the input using an envelope follower? So this is the basic solution. Okay, this one has been the, our solution for a lot of years. Is problematic. It's problematic because if we take this approach also for harmonic, okay, we have a, this sort of a clean approach, but the compression is not good because it is slow. So the problem is, how can we improve the speedness of this system? Okay, watching uh, the schematic block of uh, a compressor, this is on the top part of the slide, there is a classic compressor described normally on papers. Uh, there is a computer gain, which is uh, composed by an envelope follower based on attack release. And there is a, a static curve. Uh, and the problem is that this simple device is uh, doing a sort of dynamic action on the audio. So, uh, just watching it, we derive a different approach to compression because the static curve can be described by an impulse response which is really, really short, is a, a dark. Uh, and on the other side, the attack release can be described sampling the original devices because uh, we can, for example, sampling the attack, sampling the release as uh, different uh, variables and we can 
modulate them uh, just splitting in regions so we can model each section like a different exponential and we can model whatever shape we have in the original device. So this is the approach. Uh, this system is a basic compressor without a tone, but which is doing just compression, which is simple and is very fast because the Dirac is not limiting us in the size of the partition and the convolution because Dirac is a single sample. It means we have all the speedness we want without artifacts because we can minimize the aliasing. So this was our idea. We can do this in a different way, just splitting to different sections our unit, our device. We can see we have a dynamic session on the left and we have the tone on the right. Uh, we can consider that the tone is not moving, it's like a sort of static one which is applied to the first one which is moving doing the dynamic action. So if we can decompose them in a perfect world, we can create this sort of uh, different model where we have a fast compression and a tone. So this was our first approach. We modified also our filtering approach, so our filter processing. Uh, just we, we decided to split, which is the filter, which is uh, the uh, so magnitude and the phase uh, response, from what is the tone, so which is uh, harmonic distortion, which is uh, also the dynamic action of the filter, and things like that. So we have a tone on one side and the field on the other side. Why we are doing it? Because in this case, we can use long kernels on the left side. We can use short kernels for the dynamic first fundamental on the right side, and we can use still long kernels for harmonics. So we can create a complex model where we can do whatever filter with a low CPU usage, but they can be really complex. The only problem is that we are not modeling harmonic distortion for all combination of the filter, but this is not a problem because in a lot of cases, it's just a matter of emulating the high frequency harmonic distortion more than the other ones because it's the one you can hear more. So using this trick, we can split and we can get a better approximation. So going on, there is another optimization you can do. We want to reduce latency this time. So instead of using more modules, each module is introducing latency, is introducing other partition and convolution, or linear distortion, blah, 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 blah. We can try to create a single module and if we have a complex filter, we can have other instances which are, which are making a calculation of the filter and they are sending their part of the input response to the main filter. And it's creating a sort of offline convolution of them, creating a sort of a filter on the fly, which is using the latency of the first one. So basically we are trying to reduce in convolution, trying to avoid it to using more building blocks at the same time, but using the single building block and sort of sending the input response. Okay, the problem using this approach is the following one. We can generate the input response offline, I told you, but there is a problem. The problem is that we can also create a thread, so we can create this sort of convolution offline and the weight is completed. This is not a problem at all because our process can continue using the, all the inputs response, it's just slower. But the problem is that there is a point where we have to synchronize our thread and copy the new inputs response. We can do also FFT offline, but the problem is a moment we have to copy. When we have to copy, there is the problem because the copy, which is normally a, a very fast operation in computers, really can be a bottleneck if you have really the first stream, which is really, really based on a, a small size. So this is a problem. So also trading, there are a lot of tricks, for example, for awakening threads when uh, uh, different threads uh, uh, which are not related, related one with the other one, for example, doing uh, multi-channels uh, they, they, when I work a different thread. There are a lot of tricks you can do in the computer world, but this copy should be fast. And we have a several approach, we have a lock-free approach on it, which is the bottleneck. So using this stream strategy, we can do 
the optimization I was speaking about. So this is the final model. Um, when we generate the kernels for our harmonics, we can use a sort of an engine which is more or less like the engine used in first-person shooter of game uh, console games like Doom, like Quake, like uh, now now there are a lot of Wolfenstein, uh, New Wolfenstein, New World. There is uh, Wolfenstein Two is uh, now. The problem is that normally a game, a game, uh, first-person shooter, is uh, is trying to create a sort of rendering of the of the screen of the your your picture. And this rendering uh, is based on creating a sort of world, based on uh, hiding walls, hiding elements which are not visible, and they are organized in a sort of tree. This, this sort of tree is balanced. So the point is how to create the same kind of tree, so only that our tree is based on uh, kernels or impulse response in the worst case, but more or less they are kernels, Volterra kernels, and they are sort of mixed and they are uh, executed in real time. So there is a sort of a mixing engine which is a sort of uh, making a calculation on them, trying to find which is your render, your real time render. So, like in a first person shooter, you have uh, FPS, so the number of frames per second. We, you have here the refresh rate. So you are sort of refreshing the rate I was describing before, which is connected with the FFT size, the minimum FFT size. Now and you understand that everything is connected. We need to render the new set of impulse response. We need to, to make this sort of offline calculation to send data and to copy before the deadlines. So this is the problem. Uh, this sort of a section can be combined in a wall model I was describing before. So there is generation of kernels. On the other side, there is convolution I described with the, the nonlinear partition and so on with our. And everything is described using a scripting language. And this is the main block. So what we are doing in Ebony, which is our recreation of the reverb, is that we are combining these blocks and we are creating a sort of a routine using another skinning language, which is describing how the blocks are connected. So we can create a complex object. Now, I was showing before, we did this. This is one of a console we, we, we sampled. Now I, you understand also the look of Ebony because there are several units combined in the, the single device. We sampled all of them, compressor, equalizer, using the technique I described, and we added this, uh, this uh, unit. I think Nick can complete now very quickly, showing compression and uh, equalization on Ebony. There are maybe several examples, so you can understand how much powerful is the system as a well, which is, uh, was created just from a sampling approach and from this basic building block approach. And also this sort of approach to convolution, partition, and non-linear, non-uniform, and so on. Okay. This is... Okay. Well, we, we have to finish two minutes ago, so I think that... Uh, very fast. I will be very, very fast in such case. Is it all good? No, of course. Of course it's not. You did it. Well, I don't know how to work with microphones. Okay, I'll load very quickly just uh, the first sample we've got. Is again, it's my Reaper, yeah? Okay, maybe we can do this part, so. Okay, I'll mute for a second uh, the reverb completely and I'll just work with, with this section here as uh, you know, Giancarlo suggested he wants me to quickly demo the uh, compressor and the EQ. Um, actually, they're already on, in fact, so maybe we can hear what they do. Well, there's already something happening there. Now, Check this out. 
When I click here, I'm going to get a very different result just because it's a completely different equalizer. Right, let's just look. There. Go there. Pushing it a lot, right? It's already a very different sound, isn't it? I wouldn't push it that much, but it's just so you can hear clearly the difference. The beauty is that yeah. everything was sampled from a different device. They were collected in Italy. There are different owners of the device. We just uh, were there using our converters. We sampled them. In a few days, we created this plugin. It's amazing because you have a distortion, you have the same uh, uh, equalization of the original, you have uh, four compressors, uh, three consoles, you have the reverb, everything in a single model, uh, connected and is working in real time and you can use them for doing music. So this is incredible. It's doing harmonic distortion. Yeah, so what, what basically what uh, Stefano was explaining is the equalizers here don't have harmonic distortion and they're left intentionally clean without it. We can add the preamp later. And you're going to have Stefano an built... impulse response for it here. You're going to have an impulse response for this guy, for this guy, for this guy, for Stefano each one of these. Stefano built also the, 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 ah, the yeah, filters the because filters the filters, were we didn't find filters yeah. in time from the original yeah, developer. So he, so he built the, the filter yeah, using the original the schematics. schematics. Yeah. Mm. So. He built it using a schematic, we, we, we created the hardware, we, we sampled it and we merged it with it the an unit. Easy one. And, and yeah, so from here you would choose just the tone, so you could have one equalizer with the harmonic distortion of another equalizer, that's the point uh, that we're trying to make here. And we've got a few different compressors, I'm just going to quickly push that compressor, yeah, just uh, yeah, two seconds here. Slow attack. And we can go for the means. Already too much, right? And we can it go is, for, uh, for I limiting. Don't <laughs> I don't know if, if you know, maybe there is an, Itali an Italian guy which is famous, which is uh, Vacchi, Gianluca Vacchi. Uh -huh. There is a song uh, oh, created for him. The, no, no. Processed, I, processed with Ebony. Ah, uh -huh, okay. This no, but a, this is not. This is my song. Anyway. Oh yes, you know this one. Serious action there, hey. And you know, if I click here, you'll see that the settings kind of stay the same, but obviously it's a different compressor. It will sound different, but yes. It's got a whole different vibe in it. Uh, they are not, not just time constants. What? It is the whole shape of the time constant created in a section, in segments. What, what, what I, I guess I, I would like to you know, conclude with is, is what, what I find really nice about this technology is it actually does allow you to get something from the analog domain, even build analog bits, and then get the sound out of there and put it in the digital and add things that otherwise would be impossible. Such, for example, what we've got here is this uh, SH mod, which is a shape modulation. What it can do is it can take the attack curve of a compressor and sort of squash it or add look ahead or, you know, expand it and make it slower from what yes, it originally is. It's changing the shape of the, the, attack, uh, the attack segments. Just merging so that it can go in a direction, can be uh, convex or con on the other. Mm, mm. And this is what is so it's exponential on one side or it's logarithmic, more or less, just mm. to explain it. So it's maybe just And you this. can tune so it's not linear. And you can deform, you can morph it, and you can create it. It's just not time constant, it's just modifying the shape. Ah, so it's, it's the shape as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Looking here, how the attack, you know, becomes slightly, you know, uh, less aggressive as soon as I go to the right of the center.
And uh, yeah, I mean, in terms of reverberation, we're done, we're done, we're living. Uh, in terms of reverberation, what I want to say though is that, you know, lots of reverbs, uh, uh, there's lots of uh, convolution reverbs out there. And uh, what I personally see is a really cool advantage of this system is that it does capture the small nuances. So now imagine that you're sampling a live room of a high-end studio and you're sampling through a nice console with some old school, say, U49s or C12s, you know, all of them mics that have a lot of color. You're going to get a lot out of that that otherwise there's no way that you can have it inside a plugin. And for me, this is really what opens a lot of uh, uh, possibilities, maybe possibly in the future for uh, 3D audio as well. Uh.